I have presented a couple of times in the past to this group, um, and I'm also a board member. Um, but uh, this uh, presentation is really to summarize what we had experienced on Lake Mohawk, um, specifically for the 23 season. Um, and while referencing, um, you know, the overall lake water quality, um, I mean, most people realize that we're not just influenced by um, one parameter or the other. Um, the big one is obviously going to be the nutrient loading. Um, and, uh, but along with that, we're also going to be talking a little bit about um, the temperature, uh, the weather. Um, let's go to the next one, which is, here we go, all right. Um, the weather conditions, including air temperature and rain events. Uh, and then we also have water parameters, uh, such as um, the temperature again, the Secchi depth, which is directly related, obviously, to um, clarity, uh, dissolved oxygen, which um, is given here in milligrams per liter. And uh, while these actually fluctuate in the water column, um, the overall of this number is significant um, to understand whether or not uh, the sustainability of the ecosystem is, is viable. So in other words, if you've got um, a healthy amount of oxygen in the water, obviously we've got a healthy ecosystem. Um, it also shows us, if you're taking measurements in various locations and depths is what I'm talking about, is um, whether or not your water is well mixed. Um, you don't want to have that. You can also see it by temperature when you're taking the temperature um, of the lake in various um, depths at the same location. And basically we're looking to see whether or not you have that um, cooler water under the, underneath or lower in the water. Um, it might show that at the same time you're not going to have as much dissolved oxygen which in turn is gonna end up being an anoxic condition if it gets to an extreme. And anoxia is not what you wanna have in your lake because it can't support the life at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, what we have also here is um, our HAB cell counts. And uh, the listings that we go by or I go by in, um, dis for discussion purposes is actually based on the um, NJDEP HAB alert levels, which I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with, but I'll just review them really quick. Um, so below the 20,000 is where everybody really wants to be uh, because that's basically non-presence. Above is where we're gonna be in the uh, watch cell count, and that is from 20,000 to 40,000. So above the 40,000, we're gonna be in the alert, uh, and that's gonna be from 40 to 80, and anything over 80 is definitely gonna go into your advisory warning and danger, where you're doing other things there. And you're actually restricting um, any kind of contact with the water. So um, that's really uh, what the primary goal is really since, what was it, 19, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 2019 is where everybody was really severely impacted um, by HABs, and we don't want to go back there. <clears throat> so, in review of the season, normally we start in May, but this year we had an early start in April, and I'd like to call it actually a fall start because it started out pretty hot in the beginning of the season in the, of the month, and then um, we ended up going cooler as we ended, uh, started into May. And this was an interesting thing because you do have generally the, wake, the lake waking up, um, but at the same time the clarity is really high. So. Uh, your plant life is definitely kind of stirring, but in general, um, the water is still cool. So you have the other organisms, which would be your algaes, um, starting to kick up. 
And generally, the first thing that's going to grow is going to be, at least here, is the green algae, which is fine for us. I mean, it is somewhat of a nuisance with the clarity. And usually, again, it's in May that you're starting to see those pillowy algaes. Um, and they definitely can um, accumulate and, as I said, become more of a nuisance than anything else. But what they really do is take that nutrient loading um, away from other organisms, um, such as your plant life, as well as your blue-green. Um, so the blue-green, or cyanobacteria, is pretty a slow starter in the beginning of the season. And so what you're seeing is, in this case, in April, because it started a little bit earlier, that blue-green cyanobacteria um, population had kind of like a jump start um, going into May, which is what we're seeing here. Um, it's still kind of cold in May, and the rains don't really help with the temperature with water. Uh, so why is this important for us? Because here at Lake Mohawk, we treat um, our lake, and the first treatment that we do is temperature sensitive. So we really have to hit a steady 60 degrees um, before we can do that treatment. And that's more so for the invasive vegetation that we've got, the curly leaf. Um, if we don't treat the lake, uh, it will definitely grow closed um, mid, by mid-season. And so it's really important for us to be able to get out onto the lake as soon as possible to hit it with um, that first treatment. And so on this chart, you'll see, I'm sorry, I should have explained, uh, the blue is the temperatures <clears throat> that we have experienced, um, those ranges on a daily basis. And then you'll see the black columns. Those are actually rain events. Um, the green is where we're starting to treat on those days. So the first day was May 10th. Um, we turned our alum system on in uh, May as well, and that picked up on uh, May 18th. So we have a automatic alum feed system with our aeration, uh, and that is really because we have septic systems throughout, and we've had them since the beginning of um, Lake Mohawk back in 28. And so, uh, yeah, we have a consistent loading coming in through groundwater. So that system, um, um, alum, is actually to combat that loading of nutrients. Um, so as we go forward with this, um, we have, we're seeing here the first treatment and then we're going towards the latter half and we're seeing the population actually increase. We're still um, with the fluorimeter, uh, we're still kind of on the lower side, but it's kind of challenging for us to really see what's going on. We, our testing didn't start until uh, the beginning of June as far as the sampling. Um, however, with the increased loading in the springtime, particularly in May, uh, when we have also the rain events um, in the beginning, but more so this one in May 20th, May 21st, uh, we saw a lot of nutrient loading coming in during that rain event and therefore had another two treatments, and those were fairly sizable to really knock down again um, that uh, have um, cell count. Uh, that is usually followed by a very minor alum topical application, and again, that's to actually make sure that after you do the treatment for um, the HAB blue-green, that you don't have that uh, start up again of nutrient loading from that process. So that has worked really well for us as far as controlling that cycle or breaking it to a degree. So then we go into um, June, which again, the temperatures are still kind of warm in the, be in the beginning of June, but they level out to more of a norm range that we have. We have one more treatment in the first week in June, but we're coasting pretty well until um, the end of June where we have another treatment. Um, for the most part, we've got a couple of rain events, um, but because of our 
earlier treatments in the end of May, beginning of June, we're doing fairly well. Our temperatures are pretty good. Our secchi depth is excellent at uh, 2.7 meters, and then the end of yeah the end of the month it's still holding pretty well at 2.4. Our DOs are very good overall. These are averages, so we're not, I'm not listing the lowers um, at the lower depths. Um, they are definitely not at these levels. We're seeing probably around the uh, low six. Um, Sabine, you got a couple of questions. Sure. Just, what are you treating with when you're saying you did another treatment? Uh, we're treating with um, copper. Okay. Yeah, spot we do. Spot treating or? We're spot treating, yeah. Yeah, we do. So there's um, not a full lake. We have hot spots. So right. the hot spots are really, we've um, identified areas where, first of all, we've got low flow. Right. It's stagnant water. It's protected from the wind. So there's not much, you know, what algae doesn't like is, yeah, the wind doesn't like disturbance. Um, the flow, it uh, prefers to have uh, inflow of, of nutrients, obviously. Um, and then it's it's something where you know they it doesn't like to compete. So what we've also done in areas um, in the last couple of years, I'd say probably four years now, we've allowed for certain coves to um, develop a, a carpet, if you will, of vegetation where um, it's it's very much visible um, from the surface. And in the past. Uh, yeah, members have been kind of trained not to ask for that to be treated any longer um, because that's really what is taking care of the a lot of the nutrient loading that we're seeing in those areas. So um, we're taking a more holistic approach, if you will, as far as making sure that we've got um, the blue-green nutrient loading cut, you know, cut down a little bit. Um, when you take a sample for the blue blue green algae, yep. you just take a sample from one little spot, like, or can you take five samples out in a swim area, combine that, and then take that a sample from that, so you're not just scooping up where there might just be a concentrated spot right. in, at the shoreline. Right, so uh, consistency is the name of the game with, with regard to sampling from my perspective. You always want to be, be able to say, you know, from, from one month to the next month, from one year to the next, right. that you're taking the samples at the same location and under the same conditions. It's tough to do so because you're dealing with weather and, and everything else there, right? right. So, but um, first of all, our sampling is done by Princeton Hydro and they come out every two weeks in the summer. Right. Um, and so that is, you know, basically they've got uh, five stations that they take samples from and we look at those. The, the primary ones that I'm really looking at because I've got a pretty good idea already um, because I do fluorimeter testing as well and I do those at every single of our uh, 12 beaches. Right. A couple of them are actually not on this lake, they're at our other areas. Um, but with that said, um, I already know what the deal is as far as where the hat count is for the most part at the surface. The one that I'm really keyed into with the reports that we're getting, first of all, they're, they're usually a week to 10 days out from when they've done the sampling, so it's a little delayed. I'd like to be a little bit more proactive with our treatment because it reduces the amount of treatment. If we can knock down an area that is brewing, um, in the very beginning of this the phase, um, it will prevent uh, a full-blown bloom for sure. So we basically have cut down a dramatic amount of our treatment um, and so that as well as then going in right afterwards with alum to, mm -hmm. to strip out that nutrient load again is really working well. Um, so to answer your point, yeah. Um, Where do you take like your beach sample from? Do you just go to the shoreline and scoop up some water, or? Uh, no, 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 no. It's actually done um, at again the same location, right. and that's done uh, further out. It's so it's somewhat similar to what you're doing uh, with your um, uh, board of health. Right, treatment. So you're going out to waist deep and you're taking, yeah, okay, but consistently you. at the same time during the day and yeah. also, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are there different ways of interpreting the density of the, of the uh, HABs 
cellular count. Like when you were mentioning, you know, between 20 and 40 and 40 and 80 and 80 and above. Right. I kind of got the impression that the DEP measures the, de uh, has a criteria for determining the density of the Hobbes count one way, <clears throat> and there are other ways <clears throat> of determining the density of the Hobbes count, so cell count. Yeah. So could you explain the differences between interpreting that cell count data? So I'm not 100% sure if there's a different interpretation on that. Again, because I don't sit there and count, you know, one, two, three. But um, it's something where when I get it, I'm assuming that it is based on what DEP has standardized as far as that goes. What's more important, I think, is to note that, um, and I, I agree that, I, and I've run into this, there are certain types of cyanobacteria that present themselves differently. They're, in other words, um, they're different sizes. So you will get a higher cell count, but the organisms themselves um, will be much smaller. So it's kind of like, take for instance, dogs, right? Um, Great Dane is obviously much bigger and will have a much greater presence as opposed to a yap yap. Um, so there's this, the same type of thing with, um, with cyanobacteria, so you can actually, and I ran into it, um, it was last year, we had a very unusual, and forgive me for not knowing exactly what, which variety of um, cyanobacteria it was, but they were very small, so the count was higher than a certain standard level, a warning level um, of DEP, but it threw us into that, but the impact overall um, is much less because the amount of potential uh, cyanotoxin from the smaller um, cell is less than the larger. So you're kind of you're kind of comparing apples to oranges with the cell count. I definitely agree with that, but I don't believe that DEP has actually categorized or changed their criteria since that time. And that was actually last year that I had that issue. So the reason I asked that question yeah. is we had to close a, a couple of pieces a few times mm -hmm. because of that cell count. Right. But yet, you know, Princeton Hydro was, uh, I, I kind of got the impression from Princeton Hydro that they felt that the DEP was, you know, not taking an accurate cell count in right. terms of like the impact of the cell count, right. referencing what you just said. Exactly. So when will the DEP come up to speed about the turbulent <laughs> data? <laughs> um, okay, so the other point in that is what, we're, what, I, what we haven't talked about is actually the subsequent testing. When you get up to um, that point where you're shutting down your beaches, you can actually go out and do the additional sampling for the cyanotoxin. And so that's, it's, yeah, you're gonna have some kind of perhaps um, exposure to the cells which uh, react to the skin. It's, you know, lake rash, whatever. But the toxin is really the big deal here when we're talking about, you know, cyanobacteria. And the cyanobacteria testing will actually, so if you're at that borderline level of 80 and um, you're not seeing any kind of, and you're, it looks clear, um, you're not smelling anything. Um, I would never allow for anything to be open in that area for sure, unless you're doing the testing. But you can definitely go back and, and say, you know, I'm doing the testing for the cyanotoxin. If it's not there, then you should really be okay to open to a degree with, you know, obviously advisory. But um, what generally what, what we're doing here <clears throat> is as soon as we go up um, to uh, at or above that 20,000 cell count, um, I put out the warning. So, and the warning is really, you know, there's no restriction on lake use or exposure. It's really more so be smart about it when you get out of the lake, make sure that you're rinsing off and change your suit um, and make sure that you know, your continued exposure is uh, eliminated there. Um, I mean, I had someone 
call up and they were just like, well, I ended up with this huge rash. And I was just like, well, what did you do? And she was like, well, I swam from you know, the island to the beach and here, the tiki bar, and stayed there all night, went home, didn't shower, woke up the next day, and yeah, I had a rash. And I'm like, well, you know, you're kind of <laughs> asking for it. Um, not like that, but uh, it's something where, you know, it, it's, it's something that you should be aware of. It's more so, of course, when you're talking about um, your pet exposure. Um, that's when it, it gets a little bit more important for them to know that you have to uh, limit their exposure entirely. Uh, because they're the ones who are actually, the dogs I'm talking about really here, they're the ones that are going to ingest it purposefully. You know, you're not going in there and you're not drinking it and you're definitely not rinsing it out in your mouth or anything like that. So, you know, your, your potential for ingestion is, is minimized. If you're testing, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. If you're testing in like a beach cove that, you know, the wind isn't blowing and uh -huh. pushing water in there, <clears> is there any advantage to taking like the patrol boat and circulating some water in there? Yeah. prior to and getting fresh water in there and just circulating that water so you don't have such a concentration when you do sample? So we're, okay, so again, the sampling is, we all, okay, so it's kind of like poison ivy. When I, when I look at HABs and uh, cyanobacteria, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you, you know it's there in every lake regardless of the time frame um, for the most part. I'm not 100% sure. Even in the winter time, you'll have you'll have something going on. Um, but if you're seeing you know stuff, um, seeing uh, cyanobacteria along the shoreline where there's a pocket and it, that's something where you know it's not indicative. What you're trying to do is you're really trying to get a feel for whether or not it's a consistent number, and um, so that consistent number. I wouldn't go around and agitate the water to to make my numbers look good. That that's not really going to help me in the long run, um, because I'm really trying to protect my my membership, mm -hmm. and so um, I want to make sure that you know the potential for them to um, go into an area that is right along the shoreline in a pocket where it looks. Um, not so appealing. I mean, I don't know very many people who are going to go into an area that the water looks like, eh, it's sketchy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, I'm not taking a sample from there because it's just not going to be something where, again, people are going to expose themselves purposefully or e even unintentionally in most cases. However, if most of the body of water looks like that, that's a whole nother, whole nother situation. So you want to get you know something that's realistic to the overall. Now that brings up an interesting point because we all know that the cyanobacteria can go up and down in the water column, right? So if I've got a really still day and it's kind of um, chilly in the morning and I'm doing my sampling in the morning and the sun is, it, it's not overcast, it's, it's nice and sunny out, you know what's happening is that cyanobacteria is saying, okay, I'm going up because it's a little chilly down here, I need that sunshine, and it's nice and flat, this is perfect for me. So I'll end up with a skim of cyanobacteria on the top of the water, but as soon as I get any kind of wave action, right underneath, my column is clear. So if, if you have like a windy day, you're actually gonna have more indicative of, you know, you'll see the entire column might be at a 15,000, but on a nice calm day, if I'm taking my sample right at the top, with the same conditions, I'm going to end up with probably, I don't know, I might end up with like a 25, 30, 35. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something to actually also understand. So it's, yes, it is a numbers game, but it's something where, again, um, you, have to, you have to look at it overall, what's the potential risk? to the people going into the water and possibly exposing themselves. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, we're lucky. Um, this past year, we've always been within that um, 20 to 30, 35 range. 
There are a couple of instances, particularly at the end of um, the season, and I'm not going to go through the rest of this because it was pretty, um, pretty much the same until we hit the end of August. So um, we didn't treat very much in the in August. It was really quite good. We had a significant treatment in uh, the end of July. Uh, just to knock down again the overall population and the overall population when it gets to a point where everything is showing like 25,000 to that 35,000 range, I don't like that at all because that's where you get those higher concentrations at the surface and that's uh, and it's hanging around and the potential for a bloom that goes full all the, the entire lake is much more significant. Um, so. We did a big treatment, um, um, not a whole lake as we had in the past, but a treatment at the end of July followed by alum um, and held off. The weather was also pretty good going into, July, into August. It was kind of on the cool side. Uh, we were doing great up until uh, Labor Day weekend. We hadn't treated. Tuesday after Labor Day weekend, the lake went green, like completely. and. Um, I couldn't believe the numbers, uh, what I was getting on the fluorimeter, and two days late, the close, the soonest I could get any kind of treatment was, um, yeah, two days later, and they were out there on the lake, and so was Princeton Hydro taking numbers and samples. Um, so we shut down um, the south end of the lake, where the numbers were just by coincidence the highest. Um, and everywhere else was definitely on, a, on an advisory. Um, but after we had treated, and then we had treated again um, two days after that with the topical alum, um, those were the last treatments on this lake. And it cleared up uh, everything within like three, four days. So it was actually for us, we could have probably let it ride out, um, but in looking at the weather, and, and that's where this year I focused a lot on what the forecast was. And again, going back to the potential for exposure, because you don't know if people are going to take advantage of you know the last good week, the last weekend, whatever, before they start pulling you know their boats out. We don't um, draw down the lake um, here, so our season continues until you know the weather breaks. And while it did go cooler, we still have people out there um, skiing and, and everything else. So, um, and another consideration was, you know, if you have a if you have a healthy uh, population going into the fall, more than likely you're going to end up with increased spore levels in your sediment that are going to be, you know, potentially a problem come springtime when they start to actually wake up again. So that was another reason that we went ahead with um, that late major treatment. Lady? Hi. Um, could you speak a little bit about how you use your fluorimeter? Because I just got one recently. Uh -huh. I haven't used it a whole lot, but it was because I was concerned about the turnaround time for the sampling analysis. Mm -hmm. I wanted something more immediate, so I got this little handheld fluorimeter. Right. And, but kind of stick that in the surface so you're dealing with the elevated levels you talked about. I was just wondering how you use your word. So um, again, I go, you, we have docks that are, um, that are at each of our beaches. So I go to the same dock and generally I go out about 20 feet. Um, so I'm not getting uh, you know, right at the surface line. Um, so I'll go out about 20 feet and I'll, I'll do obviously three readings all the time. And um, if it's kind of, if it's on the surface, it is what it is, but um, I'll also agitate the water a little bit just to see whether or not there's something going on underneath. And you can pretty much tell. Um, the Secchi depth readings are also something that I do, you know, in conjunction with that. So that'll give you also a good idea as to whether or not you're seeing that cell count throughout because if I can see clear water or you know increased secchi depth, um, but I've got that skim coat that you can't see through, that that's significant. So 
Yeah, that's definitely. But again, it's not giving you a hard number because I mean, a hard number is obviously going to be you know taking the sample and, and running with it. But um, it's really getting uh, um, an idea of you know what the cell count really is for the entire column that people are exposing themselves to. Yeah. When you said you had uh, Princeton Hydro uh, do a treatment right. on a perimeter. <clears throat> Who were they subcontracting that treatment service to? No, Princeton Hydro is in our treatment. That would be uh, Lake Management Science. Lake does Management our treatment. Science. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's Chris Hanlon. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. You're <sighs> All right. The people that need to hear it are here. So, um, yeah, yeah, and. Watch the Zoom. I know, look, I know. I'm going to do it at the next board meeting. So just for a where we ending up here, um, our most recent test was um, on our sampling was the 21st of September, and um, our numbers were again getting back to where where I like to be, and that was below that 20,000 um, at 16 16,000. So. Um, now in the beginning, what you should see is actually in red, which was really scary. That was at 85,000, and that was at the south end. And again, this information is always lagging to me by about a week. Um, but again, because I had seen it, I called up immediately um, to Princeton Hydro, and they were able to get it to me a little bit earlier, but by then I had already treated and it was knocked down. Um, so it's, Again, when I look at these things, it's always better to um, be a little bit more proactive uh, for particularly you know, the health and, and safety of your membership and whoever is using your lakes and enjoying them. Because that's really, that's really the most important, that's why we're all here, is you know, to make sure that um, we protect uh, the lake environment and also all of, all of us uh, and continuing forward. And looking forward to the future, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely something where I'm looking always into different technologies, uh, although we're still treating with copper and alum. Um, I'm looking probably to see what the possibilities are from um, the reliance on alum. I mean, if anybody's doing that, you all know that it's, it's not decreased in cost or stabilized, it's going through the roof. And, um, we use, and we're probably the biggest user um, in the state, uh, and we, it comes in by the tanker, and usually our cycle, I get a tanker uh, more than once a week. So it's a lot, and um, it's something where it doesn't hold its efficacy over a long-term period. Um, there are other alternatives, and one that we're looking into pretty seriously is going to be the Utrasorb coming into next year. It's just a matter of seeing what the best uh, method of distribution is for that, and um, the amount that we would have to actually use that in this lake. Um, it's a little bit, mm, yeah, challenging to do a one-to-one -one swap. It's, but again. Um, I look forward to yeah, seeing if that's going to be something more viable because that, from my understanding, um, is showing that once it binds to the, um, the nutrients phosphorus, it holds it in perpetuity. And that's and what, that's is what, what is it? Utrasorb is um, a nutrient binder. So it's a, uh, it's a treatment that actually strips out your phosphorus and holds on to it. Uh, forever, so it, it chemically it, binds to it. How is it put in the lake? Um, it's it's distributed. It's broadcast. It comes in a liquid form, and so what we do is similar to alum, where we <coughs> we send it out through lines in the lake uh, with air, and then it gets um, distributed through um, the medium, and it goes up with the air into the column. So it could be. Put in your alum lines? Um, that's my understanding, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. And is it more expensive? It's more expensive uh, on a you know, gallon to gallon ratio, okay. but the amount of product is much, much less. Right. You don't need tanker trucks. I mean, no, you don't need, no. It's right. actually quite the opposite. The is you're bringing a tanker truck in. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're paying for the trucking as well. It's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Christine Lake South Home. 38 for late. Small change. <laughs> so this year we switched late management company. We went with LMS. Mm -hmm. uh, we find we be very proactive. We did the blue dye treatment mm -hmm. to decrease photosynthesis, and we did find that we used a heck of a lot less atomic sulfur over the season. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if anybody else has ever used the blue dye if you guys have. And we do. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, he, he started using it um, probably 20 to 25 years ago, and it was pretty funny because people were calling up, and Blake changed color, they were all freaked out. Um, but um, it, it's been working really well for us, because our lake overall is down just like six feet, um, so it makes a huge difference. And the other thing we've done um, in one of our coves, which is our primary beaches, is we put in a, a subsurface circulator, because the water used to just bring all the algae and all the nasty distances right into the beach area. So we put in a circulator, just focus on what I'm gonna say, it impacts a million gallons of water and it doesn't move a million gallons of water, it impacts it. So in the morning when the lake is really calm, you can see the, the wave ring all the way across the lake. So it impacts, it, it moves, you can, you can physically feel it when you're in the water at the beach, but it's just not like gonna knock you over, but you can, you can feel it's moving and you can see it in the spring. It really does a good job. It just needs to be maintained every three to five years from now. Yep. We've had that for one year. <laughs> In the back? Um, so I'm from Iowa Lakes, and um, we changed the Nutrisor and the Biochar. One of our lakes is a smaller lake. It's about 50 acres. So that lake has been basically closed for two and a half years, and we kept it open all summer. No blooms, clarity, people were able to swim. That's with the Utrasorb. We went from Utrasorb and Biochar. Okay, yeah, so that's what I'm looking for, yeah. It's problematic in a big lake because you have to put so many of those buoys in. Right. Boating and stuff, you know, this lake is one of our small ones, so it's more just kayaking. Um, but between the two of them, we did use sonar early on, but we kind of got away from the copper sulfur. Yeah, um, I, again, I'd like to do that as well. Um, reduce. I don't want to have to get you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're working those problems out. <laughs> so, I mean, yep. You mentioned you had a good August. Can you go back two slides to your August temp? Did you get, sure. Did you get a cool down at the beginning of August? Yes, we did. And that was that played into a lot of what was going on. And you'll see that right here. We did do a treatment, but that treatment was associated with um, what was going on in the end of July. So we had a treatment, um, yeah, the last week of July. But this, this was actually followed up then with, um, this isn't uh, copper. This is actually topical alum. So had that dip, like, we had a dip right here, yeah, that went down, and it really chilled chilled down quite a bit. It looks like in September you hit your high for the week. Uh, in September, yeah, we were definitely, and it was really kind of weird because we went in, and this was um, August 10th. The sample was 70, um, 70 thousand, and that again was at the south end. Um, so we're, there was a lag there, but we didn't treat because I felt that all the other indicators um, and what we were seeing with the fluorimeter is everywhere. And I went out to the middle of the lake during this time frame because I wanted to be sure that I wasn't just getting um, the, the shoreline effect and to, to be sure that there wasn't anything specific going down. There's one station that we have in the middle of the lake and it, it then um, <clears throat> we do sampling um, mid-depth. Mid and so um, I had actually gone out mid-depth and grabbed a sample and did the fluorimeter on that. And um, so something was not quite jiving with that 70. And, and the rest of the samples, because their, their other samples were lower, bringing down the average to 35. So I just kind of, I didn't want to treat it as an anomaly, but in essence, yeah, I didn't treat the lake because of that one outlier. Okay, and then in September we got that heat wave. The September was different. That was that was real. Your DO is nine there. Is that a that's like that's an average. 
That's average. Um, so, but the interesting thing is this year we had um, a lot of wind, high wind events, um, and so next year. Going in um, to the season, wind is definitely something that I'm going to start to track because um, I know that, and it, it kind of surprised me as well, um, with the DO being so high. Again, this is an average, but um, first of all, most of our lake is actually um, got the aerators in them. So we've got a lot of, of, of air going in um, straight down to roughly half of the lake length. Um, is a pretty um, intense system. So it goes along both shorelines and right down the middle. Um, on the south end, I'm kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of lacking in those aerators. Um, so that's where we're having our issues with um, the DO plus the, the issues with the HAB count. So I think that for us, I'm looking to definitely increase the air uh, and look into also the Uchisorb treatment, um, but watch what's going on with the wind event because we had this lake actually flip at least twice, if not three times during the season, which is not common for sure. Um, but it, it's it's significant and it's for us it's good. Yep. What, uh, sorry, Jean from Cozy Lake. Sure. What tools are you using to capture the metrics day to day? Um, yeah, me. <laughs> and um, I use, I use, uh, yeah, all of this stuff. This is actually the the data on the weather is. Um, uh, I'll have to go back and look to see whether or not it's um, NOAA or it might be a DEP um, a metric that they, that's provided. Um, but the stuff specific to the lake is all on uh, spreadsheets that I generate. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Can you comment on your phosphorus levels um, throughout the summer, how they varied, especially what they were at when you had the, uh, the bloom? Um, I don't have that data right now. Uh, that's something that I'm also looking to capture next year going in, for sure. All right, so I don't know if anyone else wanted to.